Right. So anyway, um, of course, like I said, I'm going to move on. And uh, of course, we're going to first talk about today. Uh, the Mexican Revolution is one of the things I'm going to get into first. Uh, then I'll review a little bit today uh, over some of the material we've covered. And uh, whatever time we have left, I'm going to, of course, spend a few minutes talking about the outbreak, of course, beginning at least the cause of World War I as a whole. So anyway, one thing that happened that was a major issue under Woodrow Wilson's administration in the early 1900s was the Mexican Revolution broke out, which started in November of 1910, and it lasts around 10 years. It, of course, had a major effect not just on relations between the United States and Mexico, but it totally changed Mexico forever, socially, government-wise, uh, and um uh, it does have a later impact uh, on uh, the United States getting into World War I because Germany starts to get involved in it later, if you know about it, uh, interferes with Mexico and all that, and it ends up getting us in the war in 1917. So Mexico was kind of one of the causes of why uh, the United States got in the war. Now, I'll kind of go through like how the, how the Mexican War started. Now, here's, of course, a slide. I'm going to look at that later. But uh, part of it was because of um, Por Porfirio Diaz had been the dictator of Mexico for like 30-something years, 34, 35 years, something like that. Uh, and um, Mexico had a lack of reforms that was there. One of the things that caused it, uh, the Mexican Revolution that broke out. There was a guy named, um, I'll get to uh, in a second, who was named um, Francisco Madero. He led this um, kind of a revolutionary change and reforms uh, in the country and ran for the 1910 Mexican Revolution against Diaz and supposedly won. He supposedly won the election, uh, but they believed that Porfirio Diaz rigged the election uh, so that he would win uh, instead. And so the election results helped cause eventually the Mexican Revolution to break out, which they think the official date it started was November 20th, 1910, which Mexicans, by the way, call that today Revolution Day, uh, just now like a national holiday uh, that the Mexican government has. And so from there, what happened was the Mexican Revolution, it spread from like, I guess, Mexico City to the whole country. The middle class got involved, the peasants got involved, like the lower classes. And there was talk of, you know, trying to make reforms to the country, not just politically, but also like land reforms, stuff like that. It also led to like a rise in rival dictators uh, that were trying to fight for power. Um, I'll get to it in a second, but Madero gets killed. He's murdered. Uh, and you get all these dictators that try to control the country. Pancho Villa, you may have heard of, Miliano Zapata, Manustiano Carranza. Uh, of course, Pancho Villa, of course, most famous for us. I'll get to later. He's kind of a threat to the United States. And um, one of the first things that happens uh, in Mexico, uh, of course, you've got Madero here, uh, who forces Diaz to actually resign. Uh, and Diaz goes into exile. Uh, however, there's another general named Victoriano Herda, who I just talked about. He was against the revolution. And uh, eventually what happened was um, Herda has Francisco Madero, and I think his vice president, murdered, kills them both, uh, basically, takes over the country at that point. And... Um, what happens is Woodrow Wilson's angered about this. Uh, and so he thought Madero should have been the rightful, you know, president of Mexico at that point. And so Wilson refuses to support Herta's government, uh, says it's undemocratic uh, and immoral. Uh, and um, Wilson then in return, if you know what he does, he then backs another general named Venustiano Carranza <laughs> instead, backs him. Uh, starts giving him arms uh, to fight against Victoriana Herta. So you got these two different dictators, you know, vying for power. So Wilson even goes further and begins blockading all the Mexican ports uh, to prevent Herta from getting supplied by foreign powers. 
because uh, America's not giving any supplies or anything. So Germany, that's why Germany starts supporting uh, some some of the Mexican dictators that are there against us when World War One's raging uh, at the same time. And because of the fact that Wilson backed Carranza, one of the things that happened was a bunch of incidents that occurred uh, because of this that almost got us involved in war with Mexico. They had the Tampico incident that happened in April 1914. That was where some um, American sailors on the Gulf of Mexico came ashore at Tampico, and they were uh, imprisoned uh, by the Mexican side. I guess people that were for pro Herta, Herta side. Uh, and um, the U.S. responded by threatening war with Mexico. Uh, they eventually let them go. Uh, but Wilson went further, and he seized control of the port city of Veracruz, which is on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so uh, this is all in 1914 that happened. So basically, um, it almost looked like war was going to break out uh, between both sides uh, at that point. Uh, then what happened next was um, Venustiano, the other guy, remember that Wilson was supporting, uh, overheard of. He eventually seized power in Mexico uh, by 1950. So he he takes over uh, the country. Uh, and um, so he's back in Carranza. But um, so, yeah, uh, Carranza takes over uh, and um, – Carranza begins to embrace all the reforms of, of that Madero had talked about. So he kind of starts to implement reforms of the country. This angers some of these other rivals, like Pancho Villa, thought he wasn't doing enough. Pancho Villa was mostly dominant in the north. He was a Mexican bandit and um, kind of a dictator. And then uh, they had Emiliano Zapata was an Indian, uh, Mexican Indian uh, who had support in the South, like close to where the Yucatan is and all that. So those were all rivals to Carranza, uh, who controlled the country. Uh, and um, eventually what happened that caused conflicts with us in Mexico, was Pancho Villa, I told you about, decided to attack the United States, uh, not because he hated the U.S., but because uh, he was hoping to undermine Carranza's regime. Um, I think Pancho Villa, he wanted to control Mexico and become president. So I think he may have briefly been for a while. And so uh, Pancho Villa became famous for his raids into New Mexico, uh, which happened in March of 1916. He and his bandits crossed the Rio Grande uh, into New Mexico. It led to a battle that's famous called the Battle of Columbus, which happened on March 9th, 1916. Then this battle, which by the way was a route of Pancho Villa's forces, 40 Americans were killed and wounded uh, in that little conflict with Pancho Villa. We get how many Pancho Villa suffered, but it was maybe been several couple hundred or so. Uh, and um, the attack by Pancho Villa into New Mexico angered the United States. And so Woodrow Wilson decided to send forces into northern Mexico to try to go after Pancho Villa uh, and all that. And that, that became known as the Pancho Villa Expedition, I think was one name that they called it. Um, okay, here's a here's a um, some more uh, little slides on Veracruz. Of course, there's some other slide if you want to see more on Pancho Villa, uh, who he is. Uh, Pancho Villa's uh, real name was uh, Doroteo Arango. So Pancho was, I think Pancho Villa was kind of like a nickname, and. Um, we got more stuff on Emiliano Zapata if you want to look at him as well. He's right there. But, yeah, they would try to go after him. And uh, John Pershing, uh, American general, would send forces uh, into uh, northern Mexico, around 10,000 troops or so. They took him like almost a year trying to go after Pancho Villa. He was like a fox. They couldn't, they couldn't get him, Pancho Villa. He was something, kind of a slick guy. Uh, which I guess something the Mexicans are still kind of proud of uh, down there today. Uh, they, they they would never capture him, uh, and um, I don't think they I don't think the Americans suffered too many casualties going after Pancho Villa. Uh, but even though um, the U.S. withdrew uh, by I think the beginning of 1917, 
uh, Mexico became later a problem uh, for, of course, the United States because Germany eventually tries to intervene uh, with, with Mexico and even asks the Mexicans eventually, or tries to ask the, ask the Mexicans in 1917 if they want to join their alliance against the Allies, which is the so-called Zimmerman telegram. And so uh, Mexico is going to be one of the main causes of why the United States, of course, enters World War I. We'll get to that later when I get to that, which probably won't be until later. So that's kind of talking about that at that point, um, what happened with uh, you know, Pancho Villa. Uh, and, uh, of course, we'll talk later about John Pershing. You know, he was one of the most decorated soldiers, really, um, of that period. He goes back to the Spanish-American War. Later, he's going to be the one that leads American troops, of course, into World War I, American Expeditionary Force. And, of course, I think we've talked about it before, but he has a nickname, Blackjack Pershing. All right, let me spend a few minutes today also going back and reviewing uh, over some of the material uh, that we've already covered, of course. Um, this is, of course, later for the second exam uh, we'll have later. Uh, so we talked before about the uh, U.S. role in China, imperialism and all that. Uh, we talked about the open door po policy. That was a policy developed by John Hay, Secretary of State, uh, where it said that basically uh, he thought that the European powers in Japan ought to keep the various treaty ports open uh, that are on the east coast of China and also allow equal trade. Because after the Opium Wars, the United States was really concerned uh, that uh, the U.S. would be you know, cut out of trade uh, China. So that was the whole point of what that was about. The Opium Wars were a series of wars uh, 1839 to 42 between China, the Manchu dynasty, and uh, the British Empire, which was fought over whether they could sell opium or not. And it led to the Treaty of Nanking, which allowed the British to take control of various ports, treaty ports that are on the East Coast. And that was while the British ended up in control of Hong Kong later. I uh, also talked about the Boxer Rebellion. We went into that a little bit. And that was a Chinese nationalist rebellion against the Europeans and Japan because uh, the, the foreign powers were trying to take over uh, China at that point. And so you had all these Chinese nationalist groups that all rebelled. Uh, and so the U.S. and other powers went in there 1900 and we put it down. So China is really becoming a weak state at that time. It allows powers to go in there. Of course, Japan's going to go in there too. You know, it's going to be one of those things that caused later the Sino-Japanese War, which was part of World War II later. Uh, then we talked about the presidential election of 1900. Uh, William McKinley ran re-election against William Jennings Bryan, who he defeated, mostly due to the success of the Spanish-American War. Uh, he picked Teddy Roosevelt as his vice president. Uh, he was a popular war hero due to, of course, his fighting in Cuba. Uh, then I told you six months later, September 6, 1901, William McKinley was shot in Buffalo, New York, uh, by this guy named Leon Cholgosh, who was an American, it was a really a Polish American anarchist. Uh, and um, McKinley died, uh, of course. Um, eight days later, and Teddy Roosevelt became president in 1901. He was 42. So we kind of went into, and then we talked about Teddy Roosevelt's administration. Uh, these are some of the things we talked about. Uh, 1902, uh, coal strike was something that Teddy Roosevelt helped to eventually end. That was due to him getting the mine owners uh, in the uh, United Mine Workers under John L. Lewis uh, to agree to um, better wages, uh, better conditions, uh, and it was a type of bargaining thing that Roosevelt was very good at. It also helped in the Russo-Japanese War and, and so on. Uh, and so it was one of his first things he really did as president that's well known. We already talked about the muckraking stuff that he did before uh, as well, like the Food and Drug Administration, etc. 
Uh, I'll also talk about Roosevelt, the trust buster. His most famous thing he broke up was the Northern Securities Company, which was this uh, trading company that controlled a bunch of railroads. And it was actually associated with J.P. Morgan, uh, which he helped break up. And they think that later led to the breakup of um, Standard Oil. Uh, also, he got reelected in 1904. Uh, 1904 election was a landslide victory for Teddy Roosevelt, uh, which he beat the Democrat Judge Alton Alton B. Parker. Uh, and if you remember correctly, that election is famous for Teddy Roosevelt issuing his so-called square deal, which was really like a promise uh, to give every American equal shot, you know, at being helped by the by the government instead of like one group or another. So Teddy Roosevelt was, Teddy Roosevelt was one of the first presidents to really do that, uh, to give everybody an equal say. Um, and I talked about Roosevelt as a conservationist. Yeah, he was known for that. He used the Forest Reserves Act to uh, basically put about 150 million acres of forest land under the federal government. That's one thing he did, very famous. Also created a lot of national parks. I told you about uh, like Yosemite, I told you Yellowstone National Park, uh, Newlands Reclamation Act too was another thing, of course, he was known for, uh, which was an act which set up irrigation and dams in the southwest part of the United States uh, to help out farmers uh, and other industries. So he was known for that um, also as well. Uh, then we talked about Latin America. I don't think I know about the Drago Doctrine, but you need to know about the Roosevelt Corollary. I was something that he was, of course, very famous for. The Roosevelt Care Corollary was a was a um, was a, a idea that Roosevelt came up came up with. He said that if any um, country had to intervene uh, in Latin America, it was up to the United States to do it because of the Monroe Doctrine. So. Roosevelt Corollary was kind of like an extension to the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and under him, uh, they had conflicts, with, I think, with Venezuela in 1902, which is what the Drago Doctrine was about, where I think one of their ministers came out and said that nobody had a right to intervene <laughs> in Latin America. But, of course, U.S. did because we had the power to do it uh, at the time. Uh, gunboat diplomacy, or actually called Big Stick Diplomacy, I think originally, big stick diplomacy was a uh, the form of diplomacy by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, which um, was more of a threat uh, to Latin America to keep them in line. Uh, and then if they did get out of line, uh, the U.S. would use military force, uh, which was dubbed as gunboat diplomacy, which uh, we did a couple times uh, under Teddy Roosevelt. That enabled us to, of course, go in and take over Panama. Uh, Panama was really um, one of his most uh, important things that he did uh, overall. Uh, there was a growing interest in the pa Panama Canal due to the fact that it took a long time to go around South America. And uh, Ferdinand Lesseps, uh, who built the Suez Canal, attempted to build a canal in Nicaragua, uh, like right before it. Uh, and um, it failed miserably. It was more of a French project that the French were involved with. Uh, I didn't talk about the Clayton Bull War. I wouldn't really know about that, but that was an agreement made between the Brit British and the United States to create some kind of future canal in that it would be open to anybody to use it. Uh, and uh, I didn't really talk about that, but that's what it was. Uh, then the U.S. negotiated with Colombia. That failed. And so what happened was the Panamanian Revolution, which happened in 1903, enabled Teddy Roosevelt to seize the land in Panama to build the canal. That's why Teddy Roosevelt said, I took, took Panama and let Congress debate, uh, was what he said. Uh, and so from there, they would build the Panama Canal, which would take 10 years from 1904 to 1914. Uh, of course, uh, you need to know about the uh, hay banal Treaty. hay banal Treaty was the treaty, of course, that was made with Panama, and that gave the United States a 10-mile strip of land uh, to build the canal. Uh, also, uh, we paid the Panamanians $10 million, 
And of course, we paid also them $250,000 yearly rental. This is for like a 99 year period overall. Oh, and the guy that built it very importantly was George Washington Girdles, who was a U.S. general who was part of the Corps of, U.S. Corps of Engineers. He's the guy that constructed it. Yeah, George Washington Girdles. I think I mentioned him before. Uh, then we talked about Teddy, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's, um, of course, Secretary of War, William Howard Taft. He ran in 1908, practically handpicked by, of course, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, later on, he finds out that Taft is kind of a reactionary to him. And, of course, uh, Teddy Roosevelt didn't like him later. Uh, Taft was a, pretty much a trust buster. He was known for breaking up a lot of trusts. Uh, the most famous, of course, he broke up was Standard Oil. Uh, it's not in there, but um, Taft was famous for the so-called Man Elkins Act of 1910, uh, which gave the ICC authority to regulate telecommunications like telephones, telegraphs, etc., uh, so he was known for that. Uh, however, Taft was controversial because of the Payne Aldrift Tariff Act of 1909. What that did was it raised tariffs heavily, and that angered a lot of people, uh, not just on the Democratic side, but on the Republican side as too. They were all progressive. So uh, Ta uh, uh, Terry Roosevelt was angered about Taft and would later run against him in 1912. And so that led to the presidential election of 1912, where I told you, you had four people that were running against each other. You had Teddy Roosevelt, who ran with his own party later, Progressive Party, which was called the Bull Moose Party. Woodrow Wilson had the Democratic Party. Taft was with the Republican Party. And then you also had, don't forget, Eugene Debs ran with the Socialist Party. So you had four different parties that were running in 1912. Uh, remember also correctly, too, that um, both um, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson had different platforms they ran on, which were very progressive. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt ran on the new nationalism platform, and Woodrow Wilson ran on the new freedom platform, which were kind of comparable to each other, somewhat similar uh, to each other. Uh, Teddy was also famous for getting shot. If you know about this in 1912, there was an assassination attempt on him in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, by this guy that was insane uh, named John Schrank. <laughs> I think we talked about that before. And so that's where the name Bull Moose Party came from, because uh, after he was shot, he was said that he was still strong as a bull moose, even though he had a slight bullet wound in him. Uh, Taft ended up losing the election badly because Taft and Teddy Roosevelt's Republican vote got split up. And so Woodrow Wilson won in 1912 as the 28th U.S. president, and Wilson will later get reelected again in 1916. Uh, these are all the things that Wilson was known for uh, under his administration, uh, which were part of that new freedom program. Uh, the Underwood Tariff Act of 1913 that lowered tariffs. So it kind of went against the old Payne Aldrich tariff and reversed all that under him. Uh, we talked about how he set up the Federal Reserve Act, uh, which created this national banking system where they divided the United States into 12 reserve, Federal Reserve banking districts uh, with the Federal Reserve Board that ran it, of course. He also set up the Federal Trade Commission. That was pretty much set up uh, to uh, kind of, um, it was mostly set up to, um, uh, uh, it, it mostly was set up to uh, kind of police interstate commerce is what it was. Uh, not just, uh, you know, per through each state or whatever, but also any kind of uh, international trade uh, was also uh, mostly why it was done. So the so-called FTC, which is still around the day. And then the Clayton Antitrust Act was another thing that he was also known for as well. That was an act which uh, was set up to strengthen uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act, which had been previously uh, found in the 1890s. So all those were all done under Wilson. Uh, Wilson was also known for a lot of amendments we talked about as well. Uh, they had the 16th Amendment which established the federal income tax, 17th Amendment, uh, which established uh, the direct election of U.S. senators, 18th Amendment, 
which created prohibition of alcohol in the 19th Amendment, which was one of the last ones he did under Wilson, gave women the right to vote, women's suffrage. So all that was basically, you know, what we did. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this last part of the bottom. We just did Mexico. So you can go back and just review that. But uh, we just talked about the Mexican Revolution. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move on, of course, to talk about uh, World War I, uh, of course, today. Of course, when I get in today, I am going to, of course, talk about, uh, you know, some of the causes of World War I uh, broke out. I won't get into, like, you know, why uh, World War I started uh, and all that. Uh, but uh, at least for you know, why the United States started for us. I'm not going to get in that today. But next week, I think on um, Tuesday, which I think is the, looks like the 11th, um, I'll get into uh, and talk about um, how we get in the war. But let's go ahead and first talk about, of course, World War One. Now, it has different names, uh, of course, World War One. Uh, they either call it World War One or they call it the First World War. It was the later name that they would, of course, nickname it, which broke out in 1914. You can see it lasted from 1914 to 1918. So it lasted a little bit over four years overall. Of course, it was one of the first of the two world wars uh, that would break out. A uh, very violent war. Uh, of course, it killed like something like eight, nine million soldiers would die in the war and also other civilians as well. Then you had the influenza epidemic, which killed, which killed even more people uh, as well. It happened around the same time. Uh, and um, of course, in the old days, they used to call it the Great War because World War II didn't exist yet. Um, so people would use, in those days, they used to talk about and joke about the fact that it was seen as the war to end all wars. It was so bad that they, they didn't think that they'd be able to have any other wars afterwards or no other war would be that bad uh, compared to that war. And of course, they were later wrong with World War II, which broke out about two decades later, which was even worse, even bloodier than World War I. So that's why they have World War I, because they have World War II, or Second World War II, as they, Second World War, World War, as they call it later. Now, um, of course, under Woodrow Wilson, uh, the United States would stay neutral uh, at the beginning of the war. Like when the war broke out in 1914, we didn't really want to get directly involved in the war. But over the next couple of years, like from 1914 to 1917, the United States would start supporting uh, the Allied side, uh, start supplying them uh, as well. And uh, there was later on, you know, later on, there's kind of a kind of a hatred towards Germans uh, and all that in the country. I'm kind of like, you know, blame the Germans, part or at least part German anyway, that I am. Uh, and um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of hatred towards Germans for a while uh, because, of, they, of course, in Europe they called the Germans all kinds of names like the Huns. You know, I think was one of the one of the main nicknames. Uh, they tried to compare them to like Attila the Hun, invading you know France and Belgium, uh, baby killers and stuff like that uh, that they have later. So Germ the Germans were really you know were later blamed for the war. They kind of helped start it, but I wouldn't say it was necessarily started by them, but it was kind of caused by multiple things. So that's one of the things we're going to, of course, get into today and talk about, like, you know, what were the causes of World War I. Uh, here's, of course, a map of Europe, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit and show you. But you can see kind of what Europe kind of looks like before the war breaks out. But uh, let's first talk about the causes of World War I and why it broke out. Uh, there's a lot of causes of it. They usually talk about the, the isms that kind of caused World War I. Uh, and um, before I get to that, though, I did want to talk about, in a nutshell, the underlying issues that really caused World War I. And uh, the video kind of talked about that a little bit. It kind of went in through and kind of went and talked about how there was this rivalry kind of going on between these different powers in Europe, the so-called great powers that were there. Those are most of them that are there were the big powers in Europe at the time: Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy. Uh, Ottoman Empire is kind of there too. They kind of control territory close to that region. Uh, they kind of get involved too uh, in the war. So these are all the great powers uh, that are there around the Mediterranean region, 
and uh, they're mostly involved in the war. Of those powers, the country that really caused a lot of the problems that really helped to start World War One is the rise of Germany. One thing about Germany that happened in the late 19th century was that Germany unified as one one large state, so-called German Empire or German Reich. And uh, a lot of this was the brainchild of um, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, you may have heard of, who was sometimes nicknamed the Iron Chancellor. And he helped to kind of unify Germany into a con conglomerate of um, kind of uh, confederated you know, states that would be one empire. And uh, they think the rise of Germany is one of the things that really caused World War I because after that, Germany became a major power in Europe and also in the world. And so Germany, you saw Germany like industrialize uh, as a power uh, by the turn of the 20th century. Uh, they began to rival militarily countries like Britain and France. Like Germany began to even built up armies that could rival uh, the other powers. They tried to build navies uh, to rival other powers. Like Britain at the time was building these dreadnought battleships. Well, the Germans tried to do the same thing too uh, at the same time. Also, a lot of the European powers were starting to colonize parts of parts of the world, like Africa, Pacific Ocean, parts of Asia. Uh, and so the Germans tried to do the same thing as well. And so that's pretty much part of why the war started uh, because of that. But going back to all those different isms or whatever we're talking about, uh, they always talk about uh, these are some of the main things you see here. The first three there, the rise of imperialism, nationalism, militarism, those are the things that really uh, are causes of why World War I broke out. They were kind of considered like long-term causes that happened over many years uh, that led to World War I. Of course, the first one you see there, which is imperialism, was something that um, – was caused by what they called new imperialism, which I told you about before, uh, where you had all these powers like us and other countries starting to take over parts of the world, colonize it, because uh, it was kind of like an extension of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of capitalism. Uh, and so all that helped to foster rivalries throughout the country, because when the World War, World War I breaks out, you even have people fighting in different countries throughout the world colonies, whatever, because they're all over the place. Like in Africa, you got Germans fighting against the French-British because the Germans got colonies there, and so do they. So that's something that happens, you know, later because of that. Uh, also, um, nationalism is another key. They, they always talk about that one being one of the main reasons why World War I broke out was nationalism. Nationalism was a big thing because it made people hate other countries, and think that their country was better than other countries. And so that's definitely a reason why that happened too. So people have a lot of want to, either that or want to create their own country, which I'll get to it later. That's part of why the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot, because you had a bunch of Slavs that wanted their own state. Uh, so that was another thing like that. Uh, so you have some people wanting a nation state, while others just want to fight others that have a nation state. Oh, and then, of course, militarism. What I mean by that is that there was a big arms race before the war uh, between the different sides. Uh, and so all this because of the Industrial Revolution. So each side stockpiled a lot of weapons. And so that's another thing that really led to eventually, you know, World War I breaking out. Uh, then you had all these different alliance systems uh, that happened as well, which caused it, caused it too. Uh, and uh, so you got the different rival alliance systems, number four, that last one there. What happened was you got these rival alliances, you see there, the Triple Alliance versus the Triple on top. I'll put it on the screen for you if you want on the bottom too as well. Uh, but you can see there uh, the Triple on top was an alliance formed by the French, uh, which was eventually with the British and the Russians uh, over time. And then they had the Triple Alliance was the German alliance that formed with like Austria, Hungary, and Italy. So those are the powers uh, that you would have later on that would be fighting each other. And 
that was part of the reason why World War I happened because it led to like a tra chain reaction between both sides. Uh, Italy would stay neutral, though, when the war broke out, uh, and they would later join the Triple Entente, I think, by 1916. But the Ottoman Empire would later become allied with the Germans and Austria-Hungary. So that's something you'll see later uh, that you have. And so in World War I, uh, eventually you'll see uh, two different alliance systems that are kind of opposed against each other, which is the Allied powers, which the video kind of mentioned some of these. You had France, Britain, Russia, Italy, USA, Serbia, Romania. Those are the main ones that were there. And the central powers had Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. Those are like some of the countries that were there as well. So all these are opposed, and you know, all it took was some kind of spark to set it off. And guess what? And there was one. There was a spark, of course, that of course blew up the whole thing powder keg of Europe around where Bosnia and Serbia is. Uh, and um, one of the things that caused the outbreak, of course, of World War I, if you know about it, was the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, uh, who was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungarian Empire uh, in Europe. So that was the thing that really sparked everything and caused World War I uh, to explode. Uh, and uh, that area of the world, like in, they call it the Balkans region, where Bosnia and Serbia is, which used to be called Yugoslavia. All that area was kind of like a, was a, um, was a powder keg. Uh, the reason why is you had all these Slavic people there that wanted to create their own nation state. And they were basically under foreign powers, uh, predominantly under like the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Some were also under the Ottoman Empire. And a lot of them wanted to break away and form their own Yugoslavian state. And so that's part of why they shot the Archduke. Um, and uh, his assassination was, of course, on June 28th, 1914. Took place in Sarajevo, Bosnia, now called Bosnia-Herzegovina. Bosnia at the time, of course, was part of the actual Austro-Hungarian Empire because uh, the they had actually annexed it, uh, and uh, that whole area was, like I said, like a big powder kick, just ready to kind of blow up uh, at any time, and it definitely did, uh, well, later as we'll see. Uh, there was different groups behind it. Uh, the main group, of course, you may have heard of that was behind it was called the Black Hand. The Black Hand was the secret Serbian terrorist organization. They had been behind, they had been behind like assassinations. And there was a man named Colonel Dragatin Dmitrievich. He was one of the leaders of it. He was actually a um, colonel that was in the Serbian army. He was in Serbian intelligence. And uh, they believe he was the one that they think planned it. So so-called black hand, they were called. They are called black hand because they would put these um, symbols on posters which had a black hand on it. But it wasn't its real name. The real name of um, the Black Hand was called Union or Death uh, because they wanted to unify all of all the Slavic people uh, into one state. Uh, and so apparently they began like in sometime in 1914, they began training uh, mostly young men to go and assassinate the Archduke. Uh, and one of the men which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit that was behind, of course, the assassination was this uh, young Bosnian, I could find a picture of him right here, named Gavrilo Princep. He was the guy uh, that actually would shoot the Archduke um, and kill him. Oh, there he is right there. He was a young Bosnian like student. He was actually in a group called Young Bosnia, is what it actually was called. But I think he pretty much was like a member that kind of was part of this black hand uh, organization. And um, Princep was one of like seven assassins that was apparently sent by the Black Hand into Bosnia uh, to try to shoot shoot the Archduke. Uh, and um, the Archduke uh, was apparently went, he went to uh, Sarajevo, Bosnia because of the fact that the Austro-Hungarian military was doing troop exercises uh, at the time. I have pictures 
showing the Archduke here right there. Uh, so he was the actually the nephew of the Austrian emperor, uh, whose name was Franz Joseph or Franz Joseph I. And he was the heir to the throne. Uh, Franz Joseph had a son that had killed himself. Uh, and so he didn't have any children. And so he was going to give the throne to his nephew instead. And he was married to uh, this woman named Sophie. He was uh, actually a commoner, which was kind of a problem, I think, for him during his reign. And so Franz Ferdinand was actually going to Sarajevo and Bosnia to on like a official state visit. And the um, Austro-Hungarian forces were doing troop exercises near the Serbian border. Uh, here's a picture of the Archduke with his wife. Uh, I guess they was have taken that picture when they were in a convertible car in Sarajevo, Bosnia. This is actually the vehicle, of course, that they were uh, riding in, that they were both shot in, uh, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. They still have the car associated with the assassination. Um, now, what happened was uh, there were actually two attempts on the Archduke. There was actually an attempt where a bomb was thrown at him as his motorcade went through the city of Sarajevo, uh, which missed him. It blew, the bomb blew up and it injured a few people. Uh, and so at that point, they thought that was it. Uh, the assassination attempt was over. Uh, and the Archduke decided he and his wife would get in their vehicle. They would go to the hospital to visit whoever was injured from the actual bombing. Uh, and what happened was on the way to the hospital, um, apparently the car took a wrong turn. They were backing up. Arch and um, Gavrilo Princep walked up to him and fired his pistol at him. Uh, and he killed both of them. He killed the, he killed the uh, Archduke and his wife, uh, which he killed her by accident. He was trying to shoot the Archduke. Actually shot her first uh, and then shot him. And so both of them, both of them would eventually get killed uh, and so that that was the main thing that would eventually, of course, spark the war eventually. So Princip Princip was captured after he killed after he killed uh, them, and um, he actually would die in prison. He died of tuberculosis. Uh, you can see the actual pistol there uh, on the bottom there, which is a semi-automatic Browning pistol he used. And, but he would die in prison. And so because of Grillo Princip, you have like 9 million people that would die in the war, like soldiers, uh, because of what he did. Because uh, a matter of like weeks after that, uh, this caused Austria-Hungary to get pretty angry about Serbia. They blamed Serbia, of course, for the war. I think most of the Serbian government didn't really know about it, uh, what had happened. Uh, but um, what immediately occurred, of course, because of the assassination is that the Austria-Hungary decides that they're going to ask for an ultimatum, of course, against them. Uh, and um, so one of the things that happens, I think they believe the date, uh, if I could put it up on the screen, is July the 23rd, uh, 1914, the Austro-Hungarians sent an ultimatum to Serbia. Uh, they wanted the uh, Serbians to arrest anyone that was somehow associated with the assassination, including uh, that guy, Dragutin Dmitrievich. Uh, and so I think Serbia agreed to most of those demands. Uh, however, uh, Germany um, was interested in this conflict with Serbia and actually supported them directly. Uh, the Kaiser at the time, Kaiser Wilhelm I, of course, totally black, totally back um, Austria-Hungary in the war, and actually told the Austro-Hungarians that Germany would support them overall and even give them a blank, che blank check. They needed support or money. So immediately after that, what happened was Austria-Hungary, within a few days later, declared war on Serbia. Uh, July 28, 1914. And so they really believed that that was the beginning date of when World War I really started uh, in Europe. Uh, it starts out as this war between Austria-Hungary versus Serbia. In fact, Austria-Hungary would invade Serbia, uh, which did not do well. Actually, it didn't do well at all fighting against them. 
Uh, and um, so what happens afterwards, because of the fact that Austria-Hungary attacks Serbia immediately, what occurs is that it brings other forces into the war. Germany, of course, and Russia start to mobilize their forces because uh, they're worried about other countries fighting them. Uh, and so Russia comes in. They begin to support Serbia. The reason why the Russians supported Serbia was because Serbia was mostly Orthodox Christian. Uh, and they also had a lot of Slavic people, which, of course, Russia does too uh, as well. So Russia supported them. And then Germany, of course, supports Austria-Hungary because of the triple alliance we talked about before uh, that existed between them. And, of course, Vellum the first, I think I told you already, that practically gave them a blank blank check to go ahead and attack them, and they would back them up militarily. So that's how the war starts, you know, pretty much uh, at that time. Uh, and so uh, one of the first things that happens, Germany realizing that they're going to have to fight this two-front war uh, because of the Triple Entente alliance that exists at the time, and so Germany decides to go ahead and declare war on Russia first, which they did August 1st. And then two days later, Germany declares war on France on August the 3rd. Uh, and so immediately with that, Germany mobilizes forces, invades through Belgium and into northern France uh, to attack the French, because uh, the French are really their biggest threat more than the Russians are. Uh, and so... The reason why the Germans did this was because, like I said, they were worried about a two-front war, having to fight in two different directions uh, against the Triple Entente. They were you know, having to fight Russia and France at the same time. Uh, so that's why they mobilized their forces. And in Britain, Britain, of course, being threatened by the Germans too, they decided to declare war on the Germans as well on August 5th. So at this point, you've got Germany and Austria-Hungary fighting against France, Britain, and Russia, you know. Uh, and uh, Italy was supposed to back the Germans and Austria-Hungary. They backed out of it and stayed neutral, and they'll get later in the war uh, on the Allied side uh, instead. So that's pretty much how the war breaks out uh, at that point. Uh, I've got a few minutes left. Let me just quickly talk about the beginning of the war, uh, what happened, and that's pretty much it uh, for now. So, like I said, Germany had to mobilize its forces and fight France and Russia because of the Triple Entente. Uh, and so the Germans implement this military plan you may have heard of called the Schlieffen Plan. The Schlieffen Plan. There's a there's a of course a newspaper showing how Germany declares war of course. All Europe is in arms. Uh, you can see here's a map showing you. Of course, the different alliances that are going to form eventually. So you got Germany in the middle with Austria Hungary, Bulgaria, Ottoman Empire, all that is the central powers. And later you see you've got Britain, France, Russia on the other side with the Allied powers. It's so all the areas in green, Allied powers, all the areas of kind of an orange color, central powers. So the Russians realize, excuse me, not the Russian, the Germans realize that they're going to have to fight a two front war. And so the Schlieffen plan was this military plan that the Germans had drawn up back in 1905. Uh, it's drawn up by this guy named Alfred von Schlieffen, who was a German general. And the plan was this. It was an idea to try and defeat the French first uh, to avoid a two-front war. Uh, the reason why was because the French had a better military uh, than the Russians did. Uh, they realized the French would mobilize faster. They had a better military. Uh, and then they also realized that the Russians had a weaker military. It would take them a longer time to mobilize. So Schlieffen was the one, was the guy that, of course, came up with that uh, initially. And then they, what was supposed to happen anyway, <laughs> is the theory, it was all theory, you know, about how this was supposed to work. Was supposed to, um, they were supposed to defeat the the French in like six weeks, which is like 40, 42 days, something like that, real quick, uh, more or less, in a quick, quick campaign. 
kind of like the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, where they would invade through Belgium into northern France, take Paris, and then they would use railroads to ship their forces eastward to defeat the Russians in a quick campaign over there too as well. Uh, so it's all kind of like, you know, in a nutshell theory, of course, of how they would do this. But great ambition, ambitious plan, it failed uh, in the end. Uh, and um, what happened was the um, French were able to mobilize all their forces uh, by September of 1914 with some help from the British, uh, the British Expeditionary Force, which brought over forces from Britain. So a combination of, um, of both those two armies, French and British, uh, were eventually able to push the Germans back. Uh, before Paris, because uh, the whole point of the invasion of France was to drive on Paris, capture the city, uh, and then force the Allies out of the war. And, of course, the first battle of the Marne was often called the miracle on the Marne uh, because of the fact that, miraculously, uh, the Allies were able to stop uh, the Germans in a uh, campaign there. And... Um, Eventually, what happened was it forced the um, Germans to um, into a stalemate on what became known as the Western Front. Uh, they're actually pushed back so many miles from the Marne River to the Ains River. Uh, and what ends up happening, it creates this stalemate of trench warfare, uh, which becomes you know the famous Western Front. Uh, they'll call it later. Uh, and the Western Front ends up being the bloodiest front, of course, in World War I where, of course, us Americans will later fight uh, 1917 and 1918. Of course, 1916 was the peak of a lot of bloody battles you may have heard of, like the Battle of Verdun, Battle of the Somme, which killed one to two million people. Uh, and most of the deaths in World War I, like battle deaths, et cetera, mostly occurred on the Western Front, which was fought in northern France and Belgium. Uh, a few more things before we uh, 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 probably end this lecture today, but uh, also I want to briefly talk here. Of course, here's another map showing you, uh, of course, the the push into France by the Germans. There's some other slides. We're going to look at these later. Uh, there's a story where, uh, which is famous about the Battle of the Marne. Uh, the French became so desperate in the Battle of the Marne that they used taxi cabs <laughs> to bring up people like soldiers uh, to fight in the war. They think that was one of the reasons why they were able to win because of stuff, ideas like that. Uh, and so they were able to establish enough forces to, to stop the German drive on Paris. I think the Germans also were stalled in the advance because they had to actually take some of the forces to fight the Russians in the East uh, who were attacking them like in East Prussia and all that. So, yeah, here's a picture of trench warfare, of course, which trench warfare has been around since the 19th century. But, uh, of course, it was very famous uh, during World War I. And um, when forces would go to try to take the other trenches, they would say over the top. It was the old saying they would say they would get out of their trenches and attack the other trench. And a lot of times, you know, the war was really bloody because of the use of artillery, machine guns. And before you could even get halfway to the trench on the other side, they would mow you down. Uh, so that's part of why, you know, warfare was so bad because it was mostly defensive warfare. There's a lack of offensive warfare, at least at the beginning. Uh, now, one more thing I will mention about, of course, also don't forget World War I was also known for all kinds of new weapons that were introduced uh, in the war. Just want to mention about this a little bit before I go uh, in uh, all mostly because of the new uh, uh, industrial revolution. They create all these kinds of weapons that would be used later. Uh, like, of course, you see there the use of the airplane. They started having air combat uh, where they used air fighters and uh, they also had like for bombers. Zeppelins were also used for, by the Germans to bomb like Britain as an example or used for observation. Uh, the tank was invented by the British. Flamethrower, new kinds of grenades. Uh, machine, all kinds of different kinds of machine guns were, in, of course, invented uh, around World War I and before World War I. 
uh, new kinds of artillery. I think the most famous artillery the Germans had in the war was the so-called Big Bertha, you may have heard of. Poison gas was used a lot in World War I. Chlorine, mustard gas, tear gas, etc. All that was kind of first used a lot. Later banned because of it. Um, poison gas was not used much after that. Uh, and then submarines, some, of course, new, uh, used in naval warfare, use of torpedoes and stuff like that uh, was quite common, of course, in the war. So I'm going to get more later into World War I uh, overall. Um, I'll kind of talk later uh, more into, uh, like, Europe at war. But this, this is kind of a map showing you the different fronts you can see in the war. Western front was over here. Eastern front mostly fighting in the east, Russia, Ukraine, Prussia, uh, Austria-Hungary, Italian front up here in northern Italy later, starting in 1916. Of course, there's the Balkans front they had down here uh, that was also fighting. And the British were fighting the Turks down here, Ottoman Empire uh, as well. So they are fighting Africa, they are fighting the Atlantic. Uh, so pretty much it was a world war, uh, like they say, uh, overall. And uh, I'm going to get to it later. We're going to talk later how the U.S. gets drawn in uh, to World War I, mostly due to German aggression on the Atlantic Ocean because of their U-boat submarines. And I'll talk about also how Mexico got us into the war uh, as well. So that's pretty much it today. Um, I'm going to, of course, um, remind you about a few things before I go, but don't forget about those assignments that I've got posted uh, this week uh, that, of course, I've sent announcements about uh, overall. Uh, by the way, Thursday, Friday this week, we do not have um, classes. Uh, this is, of course, fall break coming up, uh, which is, I think it's October 8th or 9th. So there will be no lecture on Thursday. Okay. So uh, I'll probably continue next week. Most of next week, we'll probably talk about World War One primarily. Yeah. So that's about it for today. So I'll have a good weekend coming up in a good fall break, and I'll see you later. So take care. And let me know if you have any questions about anything, of course, about these lectures.